Today we are looking at the Barbarian subclasses and going to try and rank them like I've done in previous videos. As before, it's just my casual opinion. I give each ranking an equal weighting, which isn't necessarily the right thing to do. The things I'm going to compare are where these subclasses differ from each other. So that's level 3, 6 and 10. In fact, two of the subclasses do get something extra during these levels, which I'm also going to take into account and also going to think a bit about multiclassing. Do let me know if you have different ideas, what things you like about the different subclasses, what things you dislike and so on. So I'm going to start with the lowest rank subclass, which I don't think will be much of a surprise. It is going to be Wild Magic. Overall, for me, it performs fairly poorly. So level three speeches, I gave a five out of ten. Yet yeah, these are all out of ten. Level six is a four. Level ten is another five. Multiclassing potential of three. And it does get an extra feature, which I gave a four out of ten. I love the idea of the subclass, but I just don't like the features it gets. So at level three, we get two things. Our rage turns from a, I guess, a normal rage into rage wild magic. So when you enter a rage, you release all magical rolling and rolling, roiling inside of you, causing a random magical effect. If you like randomness, it's kind of cool. Let's go look at the effects. Actually, I'm going to use BG3 Wiki again because it shows the full table of effects rather than me having to try and play through and get the effects happening. So here they are. There are eight different effects, and yeah, the, you get them at random. And maybe at level three when you get them, they're kind of cool, they're useful. Some of them do end up always being useful. They're not all bad. Like protective lights, which is the plus one bonus to armor class. Nice little bonus to have to you and your allies. The teleport is quite strong, actually. At the end of each turn as a bonus action, you can teleport 18 meters or 60 feet. It's a big range. Some of them are just not that great. The ones which deal damage, like 1d6 force damage, when you take damage yourself, it just doesn't add up that much by itself. The Bolt of Light, 1d6 Radiant, and Blinds on a failed DC 12 constitution saving throw. These DCs are set numbers, and 12, honestly, is very low. So it may be in Act 1. This happens every now and again. But by the time you get to Act 3, I would really think that most enemies are passing these saving throws most of the time. And so they kind of become a bit useless. Vine Growth, actually a bit annoying, because it's difficult to rain for everyone other than you. Dark Tendrils can hurt your allies you can take 1d12 necrotic damage which isn't much but you don't really want to be doing that if you can help it the top one i quite like weapon infusion the weapon gains the light and throne property but again it's random so i'm just not that impressed by it especially as we get to the higher levels where the extra damage we do is just it's worth nothing really it's just not that great then the other thing we get at level three is magic awareness anyone anyone Within range adds their proficiency bonus to saving throws against spells for one turn. So where are barbarians usually going to be? Right in the face of the enemies. So you use this and you will grant your enemies extra bonus to their saving throws. Great. If it affected allies only, that would be amazing. That would be really good. And then you could get everyone crowding around the barbarian. And maybe you could anyway. Perhaps you could have a barbarian and a paladin together. Granting lots of extra bonuses to saving throws. Which is kind of cool, but just for one turn. So so hard to know when to use this, to choose when to use this, because you don't know when the enemies are going to actually use spells against you when you have to make saving throws. So yeah, not really that impressed. It's a cool idea, but the randomness and the strength of the effects as we level up just aren't good enough for me. Then at level 6, we get these three actions here, separate actions. You on ally receives a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and ability checks. It's basically a bit like blessing guidance put into one although it doesn't affect saving throws it requires an action that's the only real downside to this is during combat with a barbarian you probably want to be swinging your weapon so if you're going to do it ahead of time that's great and in checks outside of combat useful then we get these here bolstering magic you or an ally recover a level one spell slot so we got and then for level two spell slot here if it wasn't so easy to take long rests this would be much more useful maybe if you're doing some sort of challenge run you do want to put a few more restrictions on yourself where you limit long rests this is going to be way more useful especially if you've got a lot of magic casters in your in your party but since we can take long rests so easily and it's just once per long rest we can recover a spell slot I just and it's just level one and level two is just not that great it's kind of it's okay the bonus to attack rolls is nice but we can just do it once per long rest and there's no way to get this back if long rests were more difficult to take i would definitely put this higher and at level 9, one extra thing that Wild Magic Barbarians get, they can now make allies recover a level 3 spell slot. And I gave this a 4 out of 10, the same as the level 6 feature, to be honest. It's the more powerful spell slot. By the time we get to level 9, it's not that's not as valuable. It's still good though. I mean, level 3 is nice. It's an extra fireball, an extra counter spell, an extra haste, an extra whatever you want. Level 3 spells are great, actually. 
but this is just once per long rest. So again, the whole idea that if we couldn't rest as much, this would be way more useful, but we, we can pretty much long rest when we want, as long as you are opening all the barrels out there and getting lots of camp supplies. And so then we've got multiclassing potential, three out of 10. I mean, if you love the randomness of the wild magic ridge, maybe this will go up. But compared to what the other barbarian subclasses get, I don't think this is that useful because you can't rely on, upon it to get what you want. In one sense, it's kind of a nice idea, multiclassing a wild magic barbarian with a wild magic sorcerer. So everything you do is full of wild magic. But barbarians in general don't do well multiclassing with most spellcasters, at least not for most, most of the time. Because when you rage, you can't cast any spells. And if you're concentrating before you rage, you drop the concentration when you rage. So it's really difficult to make a barbarian magic multiclass work well. And as I said, those extra added effects from the wild magic just, just, just not that needed. They're not that great. So yeah, for me, wild magic, definitely third. But as I've said in the other videos for the other subclasses, this doesn't mean you can't use a wild magic barbarian. It's just, it's just not for me. You should use whatever you find fun or whatever fits your party. If you want to roleplay a wild magic barbarian, please do it. Go ahead. You probably won't be too disappointed. Sorry, and then on to the level 10 feature. Forgot to actually do it just now. When you're raging and you take damage or fail a saving throw, then you can, if you want to, you can trigger another wild magic effect. But since these effects are when you're level 10, again, most of them are not that useful. Sure, you get to, I guess, re-roll the wild magic effect. Maybe you want to aim for the teleportation, the extra armor class. Perhaps those are really good for you and your party. But it's just, it's random. And for me, too random. I can't rely upon it. By the time I'm level 10, I don't particularly care about changing the effect that much because they're not that strong when you get to level 10. So overall, they get 21 out of, I guess, 50. when we get all of this together. And for me, second place, Berserker. One thing that makes the Berserker scores kind of significantly lower in a sense than the other subclasses is this is the only subclass that doesn't get something different outside of levels 3, 6, and 10. So it's really lacking you know, any sort of input from that. So we give the level 3 feature an 8 out of 10, level 6 a 6 out of 10, the level 10 a 4 out of 10, multi-class can potential a 7, and extra features a 0 because they don't get any. So at level 3, what happens? We don't rage, we frenzy instead. Which is cool, because it means with your bonus action, which obviously you can't use on the same turn you go into a frenzy, but you can always use your bonus action to do a melee attack or throw. Throw something. One really cool thing about the enraged throw is if you hit an enemy, it knocks them prone. There's no saving throw against this. You've just got to hit the enemy, which is really powerful at making enemy casters drop concentration because when you're prone, you lose concentration. There is a downside to this though. So when you attack, it will cause a stack of frenzied strain which adds a penalty. So if you've done one frenzied strike, you get a minus one to hit for all the subsequent strikes that you do, attacks that you do while frenzied. If you do two frenzied strikes, then you'd have a minus two to hit. So it can start to stack up quite quickly. But the fact is it gives you the option of an extra attack with your bonus action. And with the throw, you can throw anything and knock a creature prone, which is very powerful. So I like it. Then level six, we get minus rage. The rage becomes all consuming, repelling outside influence. So when frenzied, not rage, you can't be charmed or frightened and calm emotions no longer end your rage. So this is kind of, I guess it's nice. Right? It's a good like ribbon sort of defensive ability we get here. It's a sort of situation where you probably don't use it most of the time. But when you do need it, you're probably so thankful that you've got it. The one unfortunate thing is we can't go into a frenzy unless we're in combat. So for example, if you're fighting Orin and you know she will frighten you, fear you. You can't go into a frenzy ahead of time to kind of get out of that. And it is nice that Calm Emotions doesn't end your rage, which means if you want to protect your whole party from being frightened or charmed and you cast Calm Emotions, you won't affect your Barbarian. But it's not like a particularly powerful feature. It's kind of, yeah, nice and defensive, but you won't use it in most combats, which for me makes it, you know, I can't give this a high number if I'm not using it most of the time. Then at level 10, we get this new action, Intimidating Presence. Menace an enemy, and it has to be an enemy, not a neutral NPC, and instill a terrible fear within them. And this means they will actually run away, right? You must run away from a source of fear. Can't take any additional actions. You can maintain intimidating presence to prolong the target's fear. And if the target resists this effect, it can't be targeted again into the long rest. So it sounds kind of cool. It doesn't require concentration. It doesn't use any resources, so you can use this, use this again and again and again. But there are two things here that mean I just feel like I can't give it a high score. First of all, the fact is it uses an action 
And generally, if there are enemies around, you're in combat. And if I use my action to do this, I am not doing what barbarians traditionally do, which is whack people over the head. If I've got a barbarian, I want them to whack people over the head. Now, secondly, it doesn't say it here. There is actually a wisdom saving throw to resist this. So, like here, if, it, if the target resists this effect. And the saving throw is based off your charisma. I would suggest many barbarians don't have a high charisma, at least not necessarily. You could try and make a, a barbarian very charismatic and try and get a high spell save DC. But by the time you get to level 10, the enemy wisdom saving throws are generally fairly high. And so they're likely to resist you. And if you use your action for this and it's resisted, you've wasted your turn. Now that's true for the spellcasters, but I would also suggest spellcasters have a higher DC by the time we get to level 10 than a barbarian would ever have. Because I am giving my spellcasters equipment that increases the spell save DC. I'm not going to do that for a barbarian. For a barbarian, I want to have items that increase damage and maybe some sort of resistance hit points, something defensive. I am not going to be having a high charisma normally for my barbarian. But yeah, for me, a 4 out of 10, just because of the action and the fact it's the wisdom saving throw with a spell save DC set by your charisma. Multiclassing potential, I gave a 7 out of 10. I quite like the fact that berserkers get this frenzied strike. And this works well with martial classes. And as I said earlier, barbarians generally don't multiclass well with magic casters, magic users. They do tend to work well with other melee classes. And most melee classes don't get an attack with their bonus action. You could even multiclass with a thief, like the rogue subclass of thief, to get two bonus actions. So you can do one frenzied strike and one frenzied throw. Now, unfortunately, like I said, the extra features just doesn't get any. So I can't give it anything higher than a zero, which is unfortunate. And actually, in the end, the total for the Berserker wasn't that much higher than the Wild Magic Barbarian. I actually don't like. I think the Berserker is significantly better than the Wild Magic Barbarian. But the fact it doesn't get any extra features and using my own system, I, I do understand this. I do take blame for this. Using my own system, the score just doesn't get that high. So the total was 25 out of well, 50. And the Wild Magic Barbarian was 21. I think those numbers are closer than how I feel about the classes. So yes, that leaves number one to be the Wild Heart. So level 3 features, 10 out of 10. Level 6, 10 out of 10. Maybe that's a bit generous, but it doesn't really affect the, the ranking overall anyway. Level 10 features, 7 out of 10. Multiclassing, another 7. And extra feature, it gets an extra feature, a 6 out of 10. And again, these are just compared to the other subclasses, not other classes and the subclasses of other classes. So what do we get at level 3 as a Wild Heart Barbarian? Well, first of all, before I pick my bestial heart, I can speak with animals. It's not the most impressive spell to have. Speak with animal potions are very cheap. You're likely to have access to it anyway. It is also a ritual for the casters that have this spell. But it's cool. Your barbarian can cast it. And they don't lose it when they rage, which is kind of nice. You know, why is this a 10 out of 10? It's the best of your heart. And some of this is just about the fact we've got a choice. We can do different things. Which is why, like, warlock invocations are so cool. Because we get to choose how we shape our character with the other subclasses. Once you've picked them, no choices are made. I've given the high scores to Wildheart because of this, the fact we get to choose what we do with our character. I'm going to go through these very quickly. So the bear heart gives you resistance to, when you're raging, the resistance to almost all damage apart from psychic. Nice. And then we can use an action to heal ourselves. I'd probably just attack anyway. You can only use it once per rage. It's not going to do much. Eagle heart. This is so cool, right? We can use diving strike, which lets you leap down onto a foe. And you jump down, you can knock them prone for two turns, which is really cool. Two turns, not one turn. So you actually take them out of combat for, well, two turns. Foes also have disadvantage on opportunity attacks against you. And you can dash as a bonus action. That's so cool. We get to do so many things. As an elk heart, we get a passive of an increased movement speed of 15 feet. That's so cool because barbarians want to generally run into the face of enemies. And to help us with that, we get primal stampede. And again, we can possibly knock enemies over for two turns. And this doesn't provoke opportunity attacks. So you can charge around the battlefield while knocking people prone. Tiger Heart increases your jump distance by 15 feet, so you can jump so far, to be honest. And then you get an AoE that makes enemies bleed. And there's no save against this. If you hit an enemy, they are bleeding. And bleeding, just to remind you, take two slashing damage at the start of your turn. Nobody particularly cares about that. The really important part, and has disadvantage on constitution saving throws. That means if there are enemy spellcasters, they've got disadvantage on maintaining concentration. And at the start of their turn, they'll have to make a concentration saving or constitution saving throw because of the two damage. And lots of your spells make enemies take a constitution saving throw. So this actually empowers your spellcasters. Wolfheart, you can use inciting howl. I don't use this too often. Each ally within earshot can 
move an additional 10 feet during their turn, but it takes an action, which I really don't like. But while you are raging, your allies have advantage on many attack rolls against enemies within 7 feet of you. That's so cool. If you've got just one, honestly, just one other melee character with you, they're going to benefit so much. It increases the chance to hit enemies by so much. And so you're just going to be dishing out loads and loads of damage. Anyway, you pick one of these. Every level up, you can actually change it. Change best to your heart. That's like one of the reasons I love this level 3 feature. So maybe a level 4, I want to be like a bear. Be a bear heart. Just going to pick random feats to get through this. Then at level 6, we get to customise our character once again. By picking one of these animal aspects. So we can, we can increase carrying capacity and advantage on strength checks. Oh my gosh, that's so good. Because if you are trying to shove people, that is a strength check. It's like the only strength check. And so you get to... Well, I suppose there are strength checks in cutscenes. Sorry about that. But in combat, you can shove people with advantage. So your barbarian is going to be amazing at it. Chimpanzee resistance to falling damage. I don't tend to care about that. Throwing camp supplies blinds enemies. It's kind of cool. I think that's it's a bit of a funny thing to do, but it's cool. Crocodile. I don't take this one so much. Your movement speed increases by 10 feet while standing in water-based surfaces. That's not always going to be the case. You're not going to get a use out of this in every single combat. And you've got advantage on saving throws against being knocked prone. That's okay, I suppose. Eagle, grants through dark vision. And advantage on perception checks. It's inbuilt advantage. That's cool. Elk increases the movement speed of view. And allies by 5 feet. A nice passive. Honey badger. A viewer sent in a builder using this aspect. You feel poisoned, frightened, or charmed at the start of your turn. A 50% chance to begin raging. If you're already raging, you get no benefit from this. <laughs> it's a bit sad. I think there are better aspects most of the time. Stallion. Dashing grants you temporary hit points equal to twice your barbarian level. And the lovely thing is that lots of these aspects work really well with some of the best of your hearts. So if you are an eagle heart and then you take stallion, once you're raging, you dash as a bonus action and you get temporary hit points equal to twice your barbarian level. If you go pure barbarian, that's 24 extra hit points. Tiger, you add an additional strength modifier to attack rolls against bleeding or poison targets and gain proficiency in survival. Well, if you've got... Uh, tiger heart and you're attacking enemies and making them bleed you then have an even higher chance to hit them next time which is really good aspects of the wolf proficiency in stealth and then also grant nearby allies dexterity modifier as a bonus to their stealth checks that's okay for me i don't tend to use stealth checks very often in the game i'm often most of the time staying outside vision cones wolverine when you attack a bleeding or poison target you also maim them for one turn so this also works really well with the tiger heart but anyway we get to customize our characters and i love it I gave this 10 out of 10 because of the customization. We can choose which of these aspects we want, but we can't change this every level. So if I picked Eagle, on the next level, I can't then actually change the aspect. I can change my bestial heart, but I can't change which aspect I had. At level 8, we actually get the additional class feature, or subclass feature. Difficult terrain no longer slows you down, which is kind of cool. Probably won't make much of a difference for most of the game, but it's good to have. You don't have to worry about difficult terrain anymore. And you can just run around as if it wasn't there. Then at level 10, we get to pick a second aspect. Again, more customization, more chances for synergizing, but it's a bit uninspired. I didn't give it 10 out of 10. I gave this one a 7 out of 10. So, you know, picking a, picking a tiger heart and picking wolverine and tiger is a really good kind of synergy there because both of them have benefits when attacking bleeding targets or poisoned for the case of the tiger. And what is meme? I didn't actually show you. Movement speed reduced to zero and has disadvantage on dexterity saving throws, which is pretty cool because lots of spells force dexterity saving throws. And then for mods classing potential, I gave them a 7 out of 10, and this is mostly due to the fact that we can choose our bestial heart just to give you some utility, something different you can do in combat compared to being, let's just say, a pure fighter or pure paladin, maybe, or pure rogue. Barbarians tend to multi-class better with melee classes, and this just gives you more customization, which I really like. I think I, I really do value that. So let me know your thoughts. The Wild Heart... For me, is a clear winner, actually. They got a 40 out of 50, which I think is very high. Perhaps I was a bit too generous, but the overall ranking wouldn't change for me whatsoever. Even if, even if this comes down by 10 points, for me, it's still is clearly better than the Berserker and the Wild Magic Barbarian. But as I said, use whichever one you find the most interesting, most useful, one that fits your roleplay. So thank you for watching and making it this far. Thank you to all the members of my channel, and hopefully I'll catch you in the next one.